Okay. <coughs> then, uh, then proceed with uh, with wider economic impacts, which, uh, as I said, is uh, is a way of trying to to uh, handle and quantify uh, so-called spillover effects, uh, where <coughs> we have uh, additional productivity effects. That's what wider economic impacts is about from increased size of, of an economic system. Uh, <coughs> learning for individual and companies by, by being able to, to interact more closely. Um, increased size of markets for supplies and finished goods. And if you then, as you have in many markets, increasing returns to scale in production, meaning that you have this nice downward sloping average cost curve, uh, you could get some effects in terms of, uh, of reduced prices. Because you can use your production equipment more efficiently. So it's, it's a human capital issue, and it's a, an issue connected to, to production and production costs per unit. <coughs> Uh, and in this case, funding of infrastructure comes in as an, as an issue, because if you, if you put up a toll between two places that, is connected by a, that are connected by, a, a, for instance, a fixed link or a new road or rail uh, structure, you actually put up a, a barrier to interaction. And uh, then <coughs> these nice wider economic impacts may not, not be there at all. So uh, <coughs> we, when we talk about effects in the labor markets, we are talking about sharing of workforce, that you can actually uh, use the workforce more, more efficiently. Uh, and then they use the, the, the learning effects from interaction, as I said. And you get a better match between the competence that, that each and every one has and the type of work that you can get. So th that your skills can then be used more efficiently. That is the, the logic behind this. Uh, and uh, here we have, I just uh, elaborated a bit on, on the sharing uh, aspects. Um, if the markets are, uh, let's say, the demand for, for, for uh, workers can be a bit in, in, in a bit different phases between regions, and then you can do with a, uh, a smaller workforce, a, l a smaller number of workers in total, than what you would have needed if the two places had been separated without any connection. <coughs> so if you look back to the, to the lecture notes from wider economic impacts, you, you will find. <coughs> Learning and matching, and an H mid missing there. Um, where where um, knowledge is disseminated faster, um, and, and then the, the match with, uh, with competence. Uh, and these are the this is the theoretical uh, illustration of this, uh, these effects, where this curve is the, uh, the wage difference between um, a center, and it increases with the size of the, of the economic system, here measured in the number of workers that you can reach within, a, let's say, a reasonable commuting distance. And this is the, <coughs> this is the transport, co the, these straight lines are, are uh, showing the transport costs per kilometer, which is a constant unit, no congestion in this case. I could have introduced congestion here as well. And then the shapes would have been uh, been uh, a bit different, but never mind for the for the illustration purpose. It's it's okay to to show it without congestion. 
We improved the transport system, <coughs> reduced the costs, transport costs, and then we get uh, an equilibrium here where the productivity measured in terms of uh, wages are uh, have increased and the number of workers that are within a reasonable commuting distance has also increased. So if you look back to the lecture notes and, and follow the steps, there is also an, uh, an illustration with a, with a constant wage gradient, uh, which is the sort of the point of departure for the discussion, which you can, uh, which you can uh, recapitulate by, by yourself. So <coughs> the added value from wider economic impacts is connected to this delta here uh, and also to this area beta in this triangle here. These two are sort of the, the wider economic impacts, whereas this is the, this eta is the, is the increased costs which are covered by the by the uh, commuters. This is, uh, <coughs> it's easy to show the theoretical uh, concept. It's very hard to, uh, to uh, put numbers on this. Some has tried with rather spectacular results, which uh, many of us don't believe in at all. Um, but there are other researchers that have made, uh, made attempts in, uh, in, uh, from, from rail, rail pro projects in the United Kingdom, which so shows more reasonable results. Most researchers agree that there is something here. <coughs> there are some benefits connected to, to this integration of, uh, of economic systems. But there are a high level of disagreement about the importance of them. But if you are going to work with economic impact assessment of transport infrastructure, you will for sure meet this, uh, this uh, problem of wider economic impacts and how to deal with it. I can guarantee you that. That's why we have included it, even though the empirical evidence is, is still quite, quite weak. Then um, we went on with a couple of cases, aviation, maritime transport and road. Um, and uh, we made a, an article in, uh, back in 2000 on cost benefit analysis within the aviation sector. It's not very different from what you what you are uh, <coughs> doing or what we are doing in the road sector. There are only, <coughs> there are some types of projects that are, uh, that can be uh, subjected to cost benefit analysis. Uh, like for instance, extended runways, which may take uh, large aircraft. You may improve uh, regularity meaning that uh, the passengers may not, and the airlines may suffer less from delays and uh, weather conditions if you have longer runways. Extension of terminals <coughs> and so on. The challenge connected to air transport is has to do with uh, a lot of things, but one of them is uh, interdependencies between projects. Because <coughs> capacity constraints in an air transport system can have, uh, uh, can be of various types, and you need to, to sort of deal with them in a, in a kind of stepwise manner. Um, here the constraints are listed. One is a terminal building. If you don't do anything with the terminal building, the traffic will level off like this. 
If you do something with the terminal building, you are back on track with a traffic road like this, but then you hit the limitation connected to the number of gates, number of aircraft that you can serve at the same time, then the traffic level off if you don't do anything with that constraint. But if you do, you are back on track again, and so on, till you hit the runway as the, as the constraint, then you have to do something. So, uh, it is a discussion here about how to pack these different uh, projects because doing something with the terminal building, the number of gates and the runway is, is a kind of a package that you can either analyze separately so the market for the terminal building will be the difference between these two lines the market for the terminal building plus the number of gates will be the market between these two lines. And then the runway comes up here. Uh, <coughs> and you have a certain amount of time for which you, you, you run the analysis. So there is a sequential dependency here between actions. Um, and you, you should just uh, recapitulate uh, Harald Ehlis' lecture on, on, this, uh, on this problem. But, but the main guideline is that you have to make binding decisions about uh, also taking the number of gates and the extension, the costs connected to the, to the increased number of gates into consideration. If you are going to take this market, because these are different traffic levels, into consideration when analyzing the terminal building. You also have to include these costs if you're going to. And then you also have to actually decide on going on also, going forward also with the number of gates as a, as a project. It's a question of timing. You should also <coughs> be very critical about when you invest in capital expansion. You can calculate different uh, at, at, uh, at which time should you invest here. Then you need to know a lot about capacity constraints and the binding capacity constraints in a system like this. So this is just to introduce you to a, a slightly more complex uh, type of project. And you have the same challenge, if not even worse, when, you come, when it comes to urban networks. Where there may be lots of, uh, of uh, interdependencies between various projects. We also have this uh, ship tunnel which is a case of cost-benefit analysis. It's uh, down southwest from here. Uh, most people think it's crazy to, to uh, do some severe rock blasting to create a tunnel to get the ship through. And this is the coastal steamer that goes here twice a, twice a day. Um, there are some studies <coughs> of this project and I have done one of them myself and I saw that that was not cited on the, in the lectures but um, the cost-benefit ratio of that study turned out to be negative and I think it is still negative even if some other studies have, have shown otherwise. And the simple reason for that is that uh, because we interviewed, and that is where data collection comes into the picture. Uh, it's always, in many, uh, in many cases, it's good to talk to people. And we actually f phoned 300 captains that was using, used to go across the waters that this tunnel should sort of uh, 
it should, should amend some dangers and some nasty weather conditions and the ship should uh, go through this tunnel instead of going around in, in, uh, in, uh, in bad weather and uh, things like that. So we interviewed 300 captains <coughs> and they said two things. Well, first of all, when the weather is bad, the last thing we would like to do is to go through a tunnel. We would like to go further out in the ocean because there the, the waves are more not so sharp, so it's easier. Uh, secondly, <coughs> the ships that will uh, use this tunnel, they have, at the time when the tunnel is finished, they have probably been scrapped and the new modern ships, they don't need it. They can go well around uh, this, uh, this piece of land without using the tunnel at all. Um, and I think they're right. So it remains to be seen whether it will be built or not. But uh, it is an interesting case for a cost-benefit analysis anyway. Then you have the road sector example, which kind of, I will not talk much about that because you had a couple of exercises on it. But uh, you could uh, pay attention to the ranking criterion that was introduced here. If you have a binding constraint on the public budget budgets, you use the, the benefit cost ratio to, to rank projects. If you don't have um, any constraints on public funds, you don't have to rank. Then you just rank them according to, to the added value to the society measured by the net present value. But if you have binding constraints, you need to rank according to, <coughs> to a, a cost-benefit or benefit cost ratio. Because then you have to see how much do you get for the, let's say, for the public money that is invested in this project. Then, uh, Professor Odd Larsen gave a lecture on transport network models. And this is complex. And uh, the, the idea was just to introduce you to something that also will be uh, an important part of your work if you are going to work with uh, transport network, urban transport studies sometime in the future. You will come across transport network models. And we found good reason to, to introduce you to, uh, to that, even if, if the format of this course is not even near to give a comprehensive discussion and presentation of, of this, uh, this, this topic. But um, we, we rely upon uh, the four main phases in the, in the work like this. Tedious work, collect data, network data. So when you, when you do transport modeling, you have to have a, a description of the transport network, which you get from software. And you have to plug in coordinates, describing from where and to where do this, does this road go, and so on and so forth, on a very detailed level. And you also have uh, data for uh, travel behavior for the people who use this network. And you, and you, uh, you, you sort of analyze this uh, and try to find out how a type of traveler, like for instance a woman, two kids, 35 years old, living in a, in a medium-sized uh, urban area, how she is planning her day in, in terms of doing the various transport movements. That is mapped by means of uh, tra travel behavior studies. So then we, know we, we get information about her, her, uh, her uh, travel behavior. 
Um, and we can use <coughs> that information in connection with um, data for um, or information about price elasticities uh, and also the transport costs of using various parts of the road network to try to say something about how will this person change her behavior if we do something with the transport network or the level of service in the transport network. Be it a new road link <coughs> or an increased departure frequency within the public transport network, so on and so forth. That type of, uh, of changes in the network can be analyzed by means of these models. And then we can evaluate, for instance, should we build a new road link or should we increase the quality of the level of service within the public transport network? which is what we, we often consider such alternatives when it comes to especially urban transport networks. <coughs> so, we <coughs> so these models, they work in basically in four steps. Trip generation, how many trips will be made within the zone, between zones. Zone is a small geographical unit. To where will these trips go? Then we need information about uh, the structure of the workplaces in the area. So for each zone, we have the number of workplaces and the employment at the different workplaces. What kind of transport mode will be used on the trips? And then what kind of routes will be used? So you see it's a question of mode and route selection, and these things are sort of done simultaneously in this, uh, this, in this, this model system. So they used to estimate travel times, travel distances, and travel costs between different places, and to distribute trips between these places and to see what will be the impact if we do some changes to the transport network. And we start <coughs> by trying to, to, to let the model replicate the traffic that is actually using the network today as a point of departure. The model needs to be able to replicate the traffic flows in a fairly robust way. And then we see what happens if we do some changes. Yeah, so this is a description of nodes and zones that, that are used. I will not go into, into details on, on this, but uh, just uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work we are actually doing. We set up a model now for uh, for a city in the south of Oslo called Tunsberg, we are going to analyze what I've just said, whether we should improve the road network by replacing an old bridge with, some, uh, with a new one, or whether we should skip that and go for, a for an improved public transport solution, for instance. So this is how it <coughs> looks like. Uh, this is a, this is a map showing the road network, and then we have a more stylized uh, design, which is which is represented in the model with uh, travel, with driving speeds and uh, distances and everything. So we see that uh, well, this road here is represented by this this link so it's a model so it's it's necessarily not exactly like what we see in the map here but the main roads are are there yeah this is what i said base case and then uh, w w where we replicate the flows and then uh, then the alternatives yeah and this is actually Exactly the same as you do 
when you are going to do the cost-benefit analysis in this exercise, you, you uh, calculate the changes in consumer surplus for uh, when going from, uh, from a ferry to a fixed link solution. We had talked about this earlier. Then, finally, um, we ended this course after all this, uh, these discussions with some criticism. Uh, and the criticism is uh, they are of different types. Some of the criticism is saying that CBA is not generally suited as a decision support tool. Uh, and we discussed why that statement has been, uh, been made. And I said that as long as the level of uh, political controversy is rather low, a well-informed cost-benefit analysis is a, is a good decision support tool. But if the level of controversy is high, then there might be some issues connected to social welfare that cannot be represented by the sum of individuals' preferences. Because that's what we do in cost-benefit analysis. We add the sum of the benefits for each and every individual to <coughs> form a kind of expression of the social benefits, the benefits for society. But, and that works well as long as, uh, as, long as uh, the political issue is, is modest or low, but if there is very controversial thing, then you need to supplement cost-benefit analysis with, with other uh, types of information as well. Critique of certain practices. <coughs> One of the critiques has been connected to the levels of value of time. And some claims that the value of time is uh, too high or too low or biased in any way, or that they don't capture all the benefits. And an answer to this has been to try to dig a bit further into the wider economic impacts issue, which is the, I think it's the main remaining question to be answered in, especially in urban areas and interurban areas. Yeah. Preferences. Uh, are uh, based on information. And in, within economics, within microeconomics, we are uh, assuming that the preferences are stable over time. Whereas in practice, they may not be that stable. You can inform people and they may change their preferences. There are examples of that uh, throughout the, the history. Which is, in my opinion, a, a valid point. Uh, so, uh, so, um, but I think in in situations again where the political controversy is 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 modest uh, and where the certainty of not very strong changes will take place in the economic systems. We can have a reasonably robust assumption that the preferences will not change radically. But there is a point, and there is a, a, an element in this, and again, back to this IPCC report that came along. Such research, and particularly if we see a lot of winters like this 
in the coming years. Um, where people really feel that something is going to change. That may affect people's preferences with respect to how they value, value transportation and movement in, uh, in space. So as, as, but as long as things are fairly stable, it's okay. But in times of severe changes, this criticism may be more valid, to, to, to put it that way. Rights, morality, talked about, talked about this <coughs> and um, the importance of avoiding the, the tyranny of the many, that many small or ma benefits of a, let's say, a small to modest size for a lot of people should not outweigh severe costs or disbenefits for a few people. So when you aggregate, one should be aware of a situation where a few people will suffer a lot to satisfy many people, but where the benefits for the many are small per, per individual. And also, there are absolute rights that should not be violated in any way. It has to do with life and, uh, and uh, certain constraints connected to, to ethics, which needs to be taken into consideration. I, I mentioned an example. Uh, okay. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, I'll just say this. Good luck with the exam and your assignment. And uh, <coughs> if there are questions, uh, you should just send me an email or, or come by my office. I hopefully will not travel as much as I have done uh, during the last, last weeks. But uh, emails are uh, a safe way of getting, getting in touch with me, at least. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully you have this course that added some value to your, uh, your knowledge. So thank you. <laughs>